So, welcome to this little lounge special and uh, we're going to be talking to Deronica from Eve Mogul and of course we're going to have Dirk McGurk on as the always present commentator in everything Eve Online. <laughs> I feel like I am being around uh, quite a bit out there at the moment. Yeah, you're on everything. I start being I, uh, worrying when you're not on something. <laughs> you know what? I, I enjoy talking about Eve, and I enjoy talking about Eve with different people, so I enjoy the different perspectives. So it's, uh, it's one of those things where I guess to do that, I have to be in various places. I'm just going to bring up uh, Eve Mogul, and I hope... Jeronica will say a little bit about how the project got started and about the old version and about the progress of uh, the current beta and maybe a little bit about where he is taking it in the future. Yes, um, hi everyone, I'm Jeronica. I'm the uh, currently only developer of Eve Mogul. Um, I started Eve Mogul about three years ago when I started trading in the only tool out there was Eve Profit, I believe. And I didn't personally like it, so I just wrote my own, and it's kind of snowballed into something I'm pretty proud of by now. Um, my last revision had a few issues, um, and a lot of people are having API issues right now. Um, but this new version should handle that with no issues anymore. Um, what EveMogul does is basically it tracks your transactions and using a first in first out inventory system, it calculates your profit. So a sell order would turn into a unit of stock and a buy order, or sorry, the opposite of that, a buy order would be a stock, sell order would be a, um, a unit of calculated profit. And I just developed the front end that displays it in a, um, a pretty manner, I guess you could say. Um, the current beta out right now, I've spent the past about five or six months on, off and on, on coding. I got a bit busy in IRL lately, but um, I'm back at it again. And this weekend, we should be able to release a good version of it for beta use. And it, it it's basically the old version, but I added a few new features in this version that I think people will be really... Uh, interested in um yeah one of the i don't know features... Caleb, do you have it up pulled up maybe yeah, you can start showing them something and right now i'm showing one of the popular features which is uh the leaderboards uh which of course uh, yes. brings on the whole competition element and one of the things that i personally feel is very um special about this is that when traders reach a certain point in their wallet it's kind of not a lot to do and I really like the fact that you then add this competition element so people can see performance and uh, monthly uh, top of the leaderboard and uh, things like weekly and of course daily uh, of course you've promised that you will iterate a little bit further on it and add things like uh, uh, Top, uh, top five and bottom five uh, um, uh, improvements, deltas and stuff like that. So Yes, yes. Um, I'm also thinking of adding in some more um, kind of like yeah. do you guys ever play Elite Dangerous with the um, whole ranking system? I'm thinking um, of adding a system in that sense where you hit milestones and you get a rank from it. So that's one option we're looking at. Um, but yeah, I'm looking to expand leaderboards a bit more, for sure. Um, with the new portfolio system, I'm thinking that'll be a good way you're to add another ahead. leaderboard. You're skipping, you're skipping ahead. Okay, well. <laughs> well, <laughs> just, just, to, um, just to present it, uh, what Jia has been doing just the last few days is starting to look at a tool for creating portfolios in game and uh, this is a very uh, special step at least for me because this is something that will really help the the speculating class and uh, 
I am looking very much forward to seeing how it develops and what tools are added to that. I'm hoping to expand it on quite a bit, so. So I'm going to very use I'm going to just show how it looks now, and uh, I'm going into portfolios on my little alt. So what we have first is that uh, you will be able to make as many containers as you like. There might be some limits depending on what type of uh, service you are paying for. But uh, I have created a little demo, but I am going to make a fresh one just so people can see how this actually works. So I can yeah, create... It, it should probably be noted that this is a subscription-based service using ISK in-game, right? So the, yes. so the low level is, what, 50 million? No, there will be a free one. Uh, what is that? That's a, 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 oh, there's also going to be a free one? Yes, there will be a free one. Um, it'll be a bit limited and not all the features. We are going to have the portfolio option in a limited sense for the free. But what I found is people like the service so much, they don't mind spending the extra 50 to 100 million isk for what it shows in gifts to them. Yeah, I mean, the statistics on the site are showing uh, somewhere over 3,000 actual subscribers to this right now, right? Um, 6, it's more about something registered users and 3,000 at the moment? Um, there were 3,000 um, people who registered over the lifetime of it. A lot of people stopped trading. A lot of people um, stopped paying, found another service. Um, but... And also, I did a little testing somewhere on another site where it would spam my site for uh, vulnerabilities, and it ended up making about like fifteen hundred accounts. So I had to fix that issue. Uh, oh, okay. So about half of them were kind of dummy accounts that were being made. So now what I'm doing is I've created the portfolio, and I am now editing it. What I will now show is that. It actually integrates directly with the Eve client. So I'm going to go on to uh, my Eve client and then I'm going to copy paste content from one of the containers. And as you can see, it has then added all the items that I chose. I chose a mineral index based container that I have in a Mars space. And actually I have weighed that compared to the volume traded every day. So it's approximately set to be 1% of the total volume traded on average in a Mars space. And you can then get the compositions and the values and the weight of each individual item in the portfolio. And then I imagine there's going to be a lot of nice historics and trade features and all that too. But just for first step, this is a very, very nice tool when you are doing big time 
investment and speculating on markets. Yeah, and we plan on expanding on that quite a bit, including um, some new features we're going to be toying with in the future. Um, trading portfolios would be, between users, would be something we could do. Um, there's also going to be a way to have a public um, like list of them. Like you can set your portfolio to be public, and people can look up your portfolio. And um, it, it, there'll be more social aspect to it as well. So will will there be uh, pre-built portfolios if people wanted to look at, say, uh, Moongoo over time? Yes. That's one of the um, ideas is... So yes. And then we can see what it contains and the values. It says that the current value is about 1.2 billion or so. Is that right, Rebra? Yeah, that's about right for the build cost at the moment. And made public, and there's actually also a voting feature as far as I noticed. Yes, there should be an Asa House um, portfolio there. says that the current value is about 1.2 billion or so. Is that right, Rebra? Yeah, that's about right for the build cost at the moment. And it looks like the most important or most expensive part of it seems to be the broadcast nodes and the wetware mainframe. Yeah, that's correct. And then it would be nice to see which ones have actually been going up and down. But uh, all of that seems to be something that will be in the next iteration and pushed version. Yeah, I just finally um, finished up this portion of it last night. And uh, so there's a few issues and bugs that I'm working through, but uh, it'll be expanding on quite a bit. So. To all the speculators out there, you should definitely get your beta account and start playing with it so we can see where we take it. Is this something you're planning on trying, Dirk? Yeah, this is actually uh, this is actually pretty interesting. Uh, um, you know, one of the places I'm at in EVE right now is I want to do. It's kind of in being an industrialist, being a, a market trader. You're roboting a bit. I don't know if it's lag. I think it's lag. However, being part of the Imperium, I'm kind of backed up into <laughs> Yes, the short answer is yes. Because <laughs> I think this is some of the things that I've been missing for quite a while because sitting there and doing portfolios manually just gets so tedious and this way you can basically uh, split all your things and uh, put them in containers and then directly link them into this tool and uh, it basically does most of the work that you would normally do manually. Yeah I would say even if you just use it as a profit tracking thing then uh, it's yeah really handy because it in the new one that Dronica has been working on, it counts in the taxes for you as well. And you can see all your transactions and everything that on a particular item going back over time. So yeah, that's my primary use of it at the moment. And it's very, very handy. Yeah, the free tier would be all transactions. You can do anything. If you're doing transactions, you can use a free tier and be just fine. Um, the higher level tiers is where you get orders and um, contract support and also um, more portfolio support. Yes, yeah, so just like station trading, then the free tier uh, will be perfect for people to just test it out and get into it. So how are you going to launch all the new features and when are you planning on actually going live? We were trying to get it in this weekend, 
Um, we may still do that on Monday. Um, I have a. I need to figure out how to get all the uh, old data into the new data, the new website. So it's a seamless transition. Um, toying with the idea of only copying the profit and stock data from old site, if you are using that. Um, that seems to be the easiest transition between the two. And uh, But I do feel on Monday, we will be able to open the gates to people and uh, get people in and this Monday. trying out the new beta sites. So is that this Monday or next Monday? This Monday, so it'll be tomorrow on the um, that second tomorrow. Damn, interesting. Yeah, um, and then as time goes on, we'll add more features and more modules to the site as well. And we have a lot of cool things coming up. Um, not enough done with them to talk about yet, but it, it's coming along pretty well. So yeah, can you drop a link in the chat, Caleb, so uh, people can go, and go to the site? Sure, will do. Uh, Jerry, did you say you were a, a developer in real life, or...? Um, no. Um, I actually went to school for culinary arts. Um, this kind of just was a hobby of mine. I've been writing on websites and stuff since, like, elementary school, so... It, it just kind of passed the time when I was in culinary arts, and um, I recently just left that, and I'm in IT stuff now. But. I still do a lot of cooking, a lot of coding at, at the same time. It's funny, before the show, we were talking about, you know, kind of real life and how it, you know, may either your real life background may influence how you play in the game or in some cases how, how you play in the game has influenced your your real life. Um, I think culinary arts is probably one of those ones that literally has no connection whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, that's quite true. Um, I guess um, I was a sous chef, so I spent a lot of time organizing and uh, coordinating people. So I guess that kind of ties into management of groups and corporations and stuff. Although I don't do that personally, but I can see where it could tie in that way. But Although you could host a player meet and cook for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> that too. Would yeah. definitely go. Would definitely go. Yeah, PL barbecue. Here we go. <laughs> Has the war actually had any influence on uh, your time and uh, efforts in uh, in your coding? Sorry, what, what was the question? What influence have uh, the war had on uh, your time? Oh, um, I actually didn't participate in the war that much. Um, I was kind of busy in real life when it was happening, so... I've been kind of staying out of it, but I've been following it on Reddit and all that. It seems pretty cool. Very, very, very dramatic. <laughs> Lots of propaganda. <laughs> yeah. But one thing that the war has also uh, brought is uh, a lot of movement in Plex, and we've had a few very interesting articles, and uh, I don't know which one of them you've read, uh, Dirk, but... Uh, I, uh, I know that we talked about it in Talking in Stations, so uh, did you see that analysis piece from, uh, uh, what's his name? Astrothy. Astrothy. Well, Ash's piece we kind of touched upon a little bit, but I found another one that uh, Lockfox also seemed to be very uh, positive about. Uh, lots more graphs and, uh, and, and maths. I will link it in chat. Yeah, that was the one with the, uh, yeah, it was the eigenvalues one, yeah? With lots and lots of graph form. I haven't actually seen that yet. Um, I'll look at it when you 
Did you see that Oops. one yet, Dirk? Uh, no, which chat did you link it in? I linked it in the Twitch chat. Uh, I, you know what? I don't have that up at the moment. I wanted to try and cure some of the robot. There, I got it. Oh, no. I didn't actually see this one. Well, he talked... Well, he talked about some very interesting uh, aspects. I, I don't fully uh, find it very informative or useful, um, except for the fact that uh, he starts uh, talking about, well, basically linking it to uh, CCP's revenue stream um, and how uh, they control the consumption of Plex based on their real budgets or their real income um, with realized uh, value and future value. Yeah, it was more in the Lock Fox realm of uh, stuff than mine, but it was a very interesting uh, piece. Yeah, I mean, each of these, you know, each of these articles that people that you tend to see during any time of of uh, high volatility in flex prices, right? Whether it be on the upside or the downside, you end up getting different perspectives out there. And and what's good about that is that's what help makes the market, right? I mean, you you, know, you want people who think one thing and other people who think another because that's ultimately what creates creates friction in the market. But um, I don't know. You know. I would like to think that CCP is doing certain things related to Plex, you know, because of their bottom line. I, what, they, what we've seen over time, right, is they continue to give more demand features for Plex itself more reasons why, you know, people might want them or in some cases need them. Yeah, and, and one of the Which is what you... has always created kind of that upward trend, right? The upward trend in prices, right? Is that the more demand you create for these, um, there's almost there's almost a limited demand side of the equation that they can create, whereas supply is a little bit harder. Supply is that, that element where, well, only if somebody wants ISK will they go out and buy Plex. Well, that's from the RMT side, because what we've been seeing with the price right. in-game is the opposite, right? We've been seeing that, that people have been wanting to store their value, and the ISK forces have been, well, a little bit out of whack, and the utility of ISK has been low, because there's not been things like wars or new shiny stuff that you would want. So you've seen this endless climb, and if I'm not mistaken, I, I, I think I, I commented on this, that you have seen this slightly endless climb since uh, since the, the, the big drama in, in, in 0910, right? Um, so you see uh, PTUs seem to slump a little bit, um, not catastrophically, but steadily enough to warrant that uh, people will then want to store the ISK. And then you see the, the, the demand of uh, Plex go crazy. Uh, and I'm not sure about the conversion from uh, uh, real money to, to, to Plex, but one thing is for sure, I would speculate that the reason that Plex has been endlessly rising is because not enough people have actually been buying Plex and selling them. Well, I, I would say buying that... With real, buying with real money and then yeah, selling exactly. them. Yeah, exactly. Buying, buying with real oh, money. So not enough well, you're... wallet warriors. Yeah, I mean, you're always going to ha have that's what, and that's what I was saying is that is that there is far more demand for the use of Plex in the game than there are people out there who want to spend real money to turn it into ISK, right? Because you've got both the people who are using it to consume it as well as the people who are using it as a store of wealth. Yeah, but I think the store of wealth have been stronger than the actual utility. And I think that's one, one of the things that they've been trying to fix, right? So now you have so much more utility with the uh, skill point trading coming in and stuff like that. Um, but what I wanted to touch upon with the, with the article was the interesting part that he kind of compared it to uh, players storing their value similar to uh, how you do it in a bond. So the players have actually been speculating in the future of CCP. And that's why the price have been rising. And now, uh, because of the war and because of these changes, you start seeing it tank and it's going to protect, well, that's my 
guess, going to tank further as we get more players with wallet coming in. So all these uh, different articles about Plex seem to be saying different things and uh, uh, looking at it from different sides. But I think what they seem to all miss is the importance of actual active players using their wallet. I think that um, the war is uh, mentioned in Ashtaroth's article, um, but he mentions it more as uh, it's tanking because the Imperium has been uh, liquidating their stuff because they were losing. And uh, yeah, that was how he was um, framing that. I would frame it as the, the reduction in the Plex price is possibly also to do with uh, people wanting injectors for changing doctrines and for um, yeah, getting a new skill up fast because there's a lot of people who've never done PV PvP before who are going out with Horde and whoever to uh, go and fly these ships around and then they get a new doctrine and they might be uh, a bit low on skill points so just get your wallet out, buy some Plex, sell the Plex for ISK, buy injectors, suddenly new ships and I think that's been causing quite a lot of the uh, uh, reduction in price of Plex. Yeah, I just linked uh, Astaroth's uh, article because what I liked about it is that it seems to be focusing a lot on um, psychology and, and, and behavior of people Better. And, and maybe more on the what do people want and do they want to activate one more account or are they panicking because the price is tanking. He touched upon the thing that um, Lockfox was not very happy about that the, some people might have been storing wealth all the way back to when the price was in the range of uh, three, four, five, six hundred, right? Um, I think that's a very small amount of people, but it is partially true if any of the real old veteran types uh, that went on long range breaks or what I call generational breaks, right? Then that is really a, a potential factor, but I, I'm still waiting and, and, and seeing how much of that will play out in the actual market. Yeah, well, I, mean, I think Yeah, I think that it's it is so easy to get injectors now. I, I think injectors are, in my opinion, one of the biggest causes of the Plex thing. It's not old players. Um, yeah, as you said, old players that have been around since Plex was introduced and have just been sitting on it. I think they would have dumped it out when it got to uh, a billion um, or at least some of their stock out. And I think a lot of it is the people, as I said, on the talking in stations who've heard on Reddit and on the forums and on blogs everywhere that, you know, Plex is where you put your risk because it's going up so fast. So they're people who aren't particularly traders or anything. They're just uh, throwing a few billion ISK in like into 30 Plex or something. And then they're seeing the price drop and yeah, they're cashing out fast. Well, I mean, you've got the traders, right? You've got the people who are actually looking to to trade Plex in order to make money off of the trade itself. But you also have people who, they just have built up wealth over time and are trying to figure out, well, where do I put that accumulated wealth I have? Um, I mean, are you going to put it into Tritanium? Are you going to put it into Moongu, where at any time they can make a change to the game that completely skews the market you know, in those items. No, the the one thing that has a standing value, a standing underlying value, is Plex. It will always, at the very minimum, be worth thirty days of game time to somebody. Yeah, and that that's the whole thing with the utility and how Plex has been king because, as a standard, it it was the thing that that added a secure utility in in everything because you knew that ccp would be rolling out more things because they're basically getting their revenue stream from the utility of plex but what i'm interested in in seeing now is could this lead to uh, a new way of storing value and this is why i wanted to have uh Geronica on today it's because if if suddenly plex becomes unsecure or at least more volatile maybe they want to diversify and if your average player wants to diversify maybe something like portfolios and proper A risk correlation calculation. tool yes <laughs> now we're gonna now we're no longer talking just about portfolios we're talking about portfolio management and correlation and <laughs> risk analysis 
So th th then we will be needing real life quants to start moving into EVE so we can get those <laughs> secure portfolio. The vacation is how you keep yourself stable in a old time market like it is. So do you think we can um, maybe uh, get something like uh, proper a risk correlation calculation? Tool? Yeah. <laughs> Now we're gonna. Now we're no longer talking just about portfolios. We're talking about portfolio management and correlation and <laughs> risk analysis. So th th then we will be needing real life quants to start moving into Eve, so we can get those <laughs> secure portfolios and calculate the risks and make sure that they are minimized or offset. Are we going to see some sort of uh, 08 crash in Eve within the next? Two years? I don't think so. If Jer's talking to us, he's not coming through. Or at least I'm not hearing. No, I don't think his mic's working. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Your other push to talk, Keith. <laughs> oh, but um, I hope we have some sort of extreme kind of situation. I love to see things burn, so... So what you are hoping for is that the universe will burn and the market people will panic and look for new solutions to store their wealth. And yes. all come to Mogul and try and, and battle each other on who's got the safest portfolios. Who's the best portfolio manager? Um, where can I get into your portfolio, Dirk? Yeah, there's just a comment come up in the lounge where someone's saying, yeah, I think you're trying to define the need for a hedge element in the EVE market. You know, that that's funny because for a couple of years now, I've been talking about the fact of would it be possible in EVE, okay, to have short selling? Would it be possible in EVE if they were to build out the contract system to actually have an options market? And funny enough, it's one of the things that I have been talking to Jeronica a little bit about is uh, if we did something relating to virtualization or um, third-party collateral uh, holders and of course underwriting. The result could be that you could actually create the options market in Mogul and then you would be able to uh, make this claim that if you're putting up an option you can't actually cancel it because right now you don't have these options in, in, in the EVE client. but. Uh, Mogul could set up something like this and that's kind of what I would imagine with when Jer, uh, Jer said that uh, uh, you would be able to trade portfolios because then you get this type of hedging and the opportunity to create something that smells like uh, contracts for difference, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there has been, you, you can do very basic stuff in EVE, but as you said, the tools really aren't there. Um, you can do, and it requires a lot of trust uh, for any sort of, uh, yeah, futures or any type of thing like that in EVE. And it's really, yeah, you can't do it like you do it in the real world, but you can do approximations of it. Like um, when we did the thing with the isotopes back when they changed the ice mining, uh, someone gave me uh, 10 billion of uh, isotopes to uh, no cash upfront, and then I pay them uh, the profit minus my cut in a month's time. So yeah, I was betting that the market was going to go up and they were betting that, yeah, I probably wouldn't make any money on it. Yeah, there's a lot of things that are missing in the EVE um, universe that are really up for grabs from anyone. And we're hoping with Mogul to um, kind of fill those needs. Yeah, so I know in the lounge we've talked a lot, it's, it's come up a lot of times over the years about why can't we do short selling and why can't we do futures and is there a way to do this in EVE? So I think Mogul, with the direction you're taking, it would be a way to sort of start bringing those sort of things in. It'll be EVE bet for traders. Yeah, that would be cool. What, what I've been... Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, you could absolutely create it kind of in a in a third party app, right? You know, but, but then again, you get into that whole trust issue, right? Because you're you're basically, you know, borrowing whatever from over here and creating your own private contract um, to really make it take off, it would need to be something that was more, that, you know, that was built more into the game, I think. 
Yeah, and, and this brings on what I've been talking to people in the lounge about quite a lot. It's like, um, there's a, there's a, there seems to be a lack of focus on how um, basic things in, in, in market and, and financial relationships uh, in, in the EVE client. Just that little thing that you can't create a bill to another player. You can't bill anyone and you can't do a uh, steady transfer thing, that a recurring transfer of, of ISK. So if you're a renter, you have to do these things manually. If you are paying for an online service, you have to do these things manually. Or you have to deposit something of a great amount and then trust that that, that account is then used for something. We have no methods of payment system. We, we, we need something uh, equivalent to, I don't know, PayPal or uh, anything that, that can be a business for for Eve as well, right? CCP should have made player billing years ago. Yeah, and I, I also think as well um, with the uh, market tools options we've been talking about that you can do chains of want to buy contracts, but as you said at the beginning, there's no nothing to stop somebody along the way just cancelling their con uh, contract. So you can put up a want to buy to one guy and then another guy puts up a want to buy to you so that in that way you are doing some form of futures but yeah any guy at any point can just cancel the contract and that can make the whole thing collapse and, and this and this uh, points to the past really because if i'm not mistaken we've not seen any changes to the market except for highlight market orders uh all the way back to what or five yeah, highlight market orders was yeah the best thing that CCP ever did for traders. As everyone who was trading before the uh, um, highlight your own orders will remember, you had to mark your orders with signatures on the end so that you would know which one, uh, you know, you would know which one was yours, and you were constantly overbidding yourself. So it was the best change that they did. But since then, yeah, they've not introduced anything really. Multi buy and multi sell aren't really for traders. Not exactly, not directly, but the 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 side effect, like uh, copy pasting, say from portfolios, now we might actually be able to use multi buy and multi sell for something useful. Um, but you did touch upon signatures, which I find a little bit funny because that's actually the origin of the SCC lounge, because there used to be a sort of cartel based around the signatures idea, the fact that you could recognize your own orders by the number signature that you put in there and then people collaborated and agreed that they wouldn't compete with each other and there was a little cartel that, that shared signatures and that was a close club and uh, basically what I did was that uh, because I wanted to have some MD focus that was not a closed club I then decided to create the lounge so we could have just normal social chat but I think as well, the other reason there's not so much focus on it, as I always tell you when we discuss these, is that uh, market traders are probably 1% of players. So prioritizing or you know spending dev time on stuff for us is not really something uh, CCP are going to put any amount of time into, really. Yeah, it's not things that sell in the um, marketing aspect. Yeah, there's no explosions on the market. Did we lose Dirk? Oh, maybe. Hang on. So yeah, we'll just try and get Dirk back. Great, and now all the video is wrong. <laughs> oh, that's classic. Not the only one that has that problem. Um, I'll see if I can get Dirk back. So what are you doing in game at the moment, Joannica? Um, I'm starting to get into capital building. Um, it's one thing I haven't done yet. So I've been all over Eve in the sense that I've tried just about everything. I've done null, null sec, low sec, wormholes, PVP, um, I haven't done much PvE in the past few years, just because I haven't had a need to. Um, 
I just, I don't know, I just wanted to try something new, and Capitol Building seemed to be a good um, thing to try out. I have is to start it up now, so yeah, that's cool. Just thought I would go for it. So, are you, have any of your guys, because I'm not down in Lulsec at all, but those new uh, Serpentis Dreadnoughts, uh, or the NPC Dreadnoughts that are like, yeah, ripping holes through all the fleets down there. Have any of your guys run into those at all? Um, I haven't heard. I, no, I don't so. really hang out with PL. I'm in PL, but um, I'm not in the social groups, I guess. Yeah, uh, I saw a horde, uh, a load of horde uh, fleets got eaten by the dreadnoughts because apparently they just land on the uh, mining belts as well. <laughs> and one of my friends, one of my friends was out mining down in Null with a fleet, and uh, yeah, just had one of the not the Spentis, the Gristers one I think, land on them, so they had to go and get, they had to warp their fleet out and then go and get the Wyvern and uh, yeah, come back in and kill it. So yes, there's a lot of kill mails up at the moment from those Dreadnoughts. So they can track the, uh, is that a bug? I'm guessing that's a bug where they can track, a, or are they um those high angle weapon dreads? I have no clue, I haven't been down there in Synet, but yeah, it's uh, a bit of a mess on Zed Killboards for the first uh, few days. I know that there's a Titan Doomsday, um, not sure if you guys seen the video, but uh, we are just obliterated a um, Cerberus fleet because of a bug in the uh, damage application. Yeah, I, I heard about that, yeah. yeah. And yeah, it seems that that must be a bug. It was a load of interceptors as well, got wiped out by one of the Doomsday things. Yeah, this is what I like to see. I like to see things burn. Yeah, it's good for business. You having any luck getting uh, Dirk back, Caleb? Uh, nope. I think something uh, went wrong. Oh, he looks like he's coming back now. Hang on. It sounded like he had internet issues, so. That's yeah, he was, he was roboting a lot, wasn't he? And then he just disappeared. But yeah, I think it was on the Meta Show last night. Boat was talking about uh, the Doomsday thing that you were mentioning, and how the yeah the Cerberus fleet and the Interceptor fleet got wiped out by them. I think I Dirk's think we're back. I can see Doug. Nope, maybe yep. not. I can hear you. Yep, you're back. Welcome back. Oh my god, I, I completely lost internet entirely there. I don't know what's going on. So yeah, while you were out, we, we were just talking about uh, the new Spentis Dreadnoughts and everything down in Null that are yeah, being quite dangerous ships for everyone. And Jeronica was mentioning about the uh, Doomsday bug where um, that Boat was talking about on the Meta Show last night, where there was Cerberus fleets wiped out by uh, the new Doomsday. Is it actually a bug or is it a feature? <laughs> It sounds like it's a feature, doesn't it, Jeronica? It does, if you're a Titan pilot, not if you're a Sir pilot. Um, yeah. But I'm pretty sure it's a bug. Yeah, I know, I know on patch day, they were, uh, there was a bug where you could uh, activate Doomsday uh, mid-warp and do damage mid-warp with it as well. So that was causing fun. Well, the, the bug that they're talking about, was that associated with being able to warp off after? Um, are we talking about the one where they were using the, what is it, the guillotine? Yeah, where you just uh, set up, uh, and as the, I believe it's as the fleet's coming out of warp, it just goes yeah, straight through Yeah, to create a pipe bomb. Beam. Yeah, so it's whether that's a bug or a feature. Both seem to think it was a feature because CCP had already known about it uh, when it was on the test server. Yeah, it was apparently pointed out to them by the, uh, I think by the Capitals focus group. 
and uh, I don't think that that they uh, yeah I mean it sounds like it sounds like a feature and 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 I don't know I have a hard time thinking that it probably shouldn't shouldn't stay as it is um, if you want to put a Titan in in the uh, you know at the end of somebody's warp tunnel and and then time your time your guillotine doomsday right how does that differ in any way from uh, you know from sinoing in you know a bunch of smart bombing battleships into you know sort of a similar uh, you know a similar position um, yeah titan pipe bombing will be the new thing yeah I agree it should stay as well I mean the thing the thing that I heard the other day was that at least the one at least the one that they had uh, you know knocked out some scepters, uh, some interceptors that that were in warp. Um, that the Titan was able to 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 immediately warp off, and I didn't think that was that was possible. I thought that was the bug that some people were talking about. I mean, there are some people who think that you shouldn't be able to use this. That 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 particular weapon um, um, used in that fashion and the way that warp tunnels kind of work um, that it's that it's op. But I mean, you know, really the 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 workaround to that in some ways is is well you know you don't warp directly you don't warp to a tactical you warp to a you warp to a different celestial so that you're coming in from a different angle that they don't quite know which angle you're coming in from yet yes yeah, from what i gathered from boat it was that they were coming into a perch above uh, a gate down in null second so that's what happened so yeah just gotta be a bit more tactical on your warpings But yeah, I was saying, you know, you know, I was saying right before I, le you know, I left that uh, that you know, from from as with what you were saying, from the developer's point of view, right? You know, how much, you know, how many resources are they going to put into into something like um, you know, very high end market trading tools into the game? Um, how many people will that will that affect? At, at the very least, you know what I'd like to see them put into the game? Um, you know, maybe some just better charting. Um, you know, better graphs instead of just a five-day moving average and a twenty-day moving average. Let's put in some. Let's put in some real quant. You know, you know, quant analysis sort of graphs because that's kind of easy to program. I think. Well, I think uh, uh, Lockfox has been talking to Quant about this, and basically, the, the the irony is that the the information and and the code that the Prosper Show is using to make those nice graphs is actually directly from Quant. So, so he's basically uh, kind of expecting it to come in game soon because he's saying uh, CCP Quanta said that he ro he really wants to uh, get a uh, a proper uh, graph tool in the game soon. So maybe maybe very soon. Uh, but even even if it wasn't for actual use in trading, okay, I mean, w which some people will use it for, right? um, it would look prettier. It would look more modern and current. Yeah, because the graphing game is, it looks very dated, and I have issues with uh, the price history actually in game. Um, when I've been going through uh, showing people uh, how to use it, I think there's a, their algorithm for clearing out the outliers is sometimes a bit overzealous. And when I've looked through Tech 2 modules, for example, um, it will say that on a particular day there were 2,000 modules sold at exactly one price, not 0.01. Uh, difference between them and so the chances of that happening are way too slim so I think their um, their normalization algorithm is just overzealous at times so I would like to see them update that because you can't trust the price history and I've got wallet transactions that show different numbers to what the price history shows uh, either I've sold below it or above it um, and yeah that's definitely something they should improve now, in talking of stations, we talked a lot about uh, Plex and what one player out there was trying to trying to do with their walls. And uh, what's come of that since then? As far as I know, because um, on talking in stations, I never actually got to finish the full story. I it was just I explained how he set up uh, eighteen trillion of Plex orders without having that much risk. I didn't actually explain what the point of it was so um, it wasn't to do a margin scam and to just go yeah hey I've set up a big wall of plex it was to uh, be able to flip them um, and because he set them up at the lower prices 
uh, the lower tax rates. When then when he moves them up, uh, the idea was that he can then uh, get a lower tax rate than everyone else on the buy side. So when he flips them to the sell side, he can undercut people. And basically, in with Plex, in uh, a day, the the volume of Plex is not traded equally. The, there's 35% of it is traded in a couple of hours every day. So if you're online at that time and you can control the buys and sells, then you will get all the Plex that are going through in that time window. And so his estimated uh, output that he could get a day from Plex would be uh, 50 billion. Um, so his plan is over a couple of months to liquidate or you know buy and sell all, all that 18,000 units of Plex, um, which would lead to him getting just over a trillion back from his initial investment, um, which isn't a bad return, to be honest. And as far as I know, it's going along okay. Um, last I heard, he flipped about 700 Plex so far. So yeah, it's coming along. Yeah, and his, uh, uh, his advantage will hold as long as <clears throat> Plex does not tank like below some crazy bottom level that uh, is totally theoretical. It's like what? Is it 200 million or something before anyone else will be able to compete on the same level as him? Yeah, it's, it's just that he can, because he hasn't, he's only got uh, the 60, 60 to 70 billion tied up in the Plex at the moment. So as long as Plex doesn't go below uh, 60 billion for 18,000 units, he can just hold the orders there and then update when he wants to flip them. So yeah, he's not worried about the prices crashing because it he hasn't got the four and a half trillion esque tied up in the broker fees at the moment or in the escrow so and then if you add the fact that every time you modify an order it resets the timer right then basically this can go on forever and it will even last past any new change because as long as he's just changing it a little bit he still got that benefit so if CCP increases the taxes which they are going to do eventually. If he does not have, uh, if he's not finished his project yet, his orders will still be there. So the waterplex will persist. It's not going to go away. His one trillion is guaranteed on yeah, that small much. investment, regardless yeah, of how fast it comes back. And yeah, the original idea was to do it in smaller orders, so that a it wouldn't be so noticeable, um, and b then he wouldn't be wouldn't have risked because on the first day when plex crashed it very nearly got down to where his uh whole wall of plex was it was uh five or ten orders were above him at one point before he moved them back down to 849 million -ish. so yeah it, it was very risky on the first day but if he'd have split it into say stacks of 50 uh then nobody would have particularly noticed and he could have just move them up slowly over time um, and he was also going to go into other items as well injectors extractors and there was a whole portfolio of items that you could get not the big returns on plex and injectors but around half a billion a day uh, by flipping them so yeah it wasn't originally going to be a huge wall of plex so but it's definitely an interesting thing that he did knowing how he took advantage of this mechanic do you think that they're going to take a look at that, Doug? Do you think they're going to, I don't know, nerf it? You know, if Dr. E were still here, I would say absolutely. Um, you go back to the the doctrine that he sort of lived by uh, during his tenure at CCP, and you know, for anybody, well, I imagine everybody who's listening to this probably knows that he was the he was the chief economist back when. He was the one and only, uh, as far as I know, chief economist that CCP has had. Um, but his whole thing was about stability of Plex prices, right? It, it, it was not about whether they went up. It was not about whether they went down. It wasn't about whether they were too low or too high. It was just about the rate at which they they moved in time. Yeah, he didn't um, like volatility. He didn't like uh, big changes too, that was too fast because I, I think he's very much of the regulatory school, right? I, it, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that that yeah, yes, again, you know, the price stability. Um, he was concerned about you know you know spikes or or, or or major declines and and at least understanding what was driving them. 
And if it was a game mechanic that with a, a spike or a crash, then he wanted to be able to react to that. Um, and if it was and if it was market manipulation, he also wanted to be re able to react to that just because Plex is a different animal than say than say Tritanium, right? Uh, you know, if, if, if Tritanium spikes, that may in fact lead to miners going out and mining more Veldspar and, and you know, fixing it from a supply and demand level. It's a little bit harder when you're dealing with Plex where just because Plex goes up doesn't necessarily mean that more people are gonna reach into their real world wallets in order to supply Plex to the market. And, and I think the interesting part here is that if you if you compare this to what I, I read the um, quant said was it on the was it on the reddit post well but basically what he said was that they no longer like to mess with anything in game directly they don't want to do the things like like with uh, injecting plex into the into the market and what he said is that it is a lot better for them to tweak the game mechanics, right? To tweak the supply of raw, or to tweak the the isk faucets or sinks and stuff like that. But in this case, there is no such mechanic available. Nothing like that. Nothing game mechanic wise is going to change it, except if they actually nerf this particular feature or how that works. Because the the problem is that if if I'm not mistaken, is that uh, the the escrowed uh, money that you put in to to margin trade that's taken first and not spread out over your entire order and, and yeah. if it had been put in so it was proportionally spread or if it was in the end these things could never happen but then the benefit of the feature would also change a lot so so there's a lot of things they have to consider because uh, well, now it's not a huge thing because it's only like one trillion or thereabouts. But uh, if he had managed to get the support, this would have been a lot more, right? Yeah, because if he'd have, if if he's getting uh, he's got eighteen trillion of orders set up with uh, someone said maximum one hundred eighty billion uh, isk. If he'd have managed to get two trillion investment or something, then you can imagine how many trillion or. Uh, trillion worth of orders he would have managed to set up on the market and it would have been problematic but I think that um, people have been complaining for a lot of years about margin trading and about that it should be removed as a skill and whether it makes CCP look at it again because yeah this as I was trying to explain to someone yesterday uh, this is actually a very simple thing that the guy's done it's just extreme leveraging um, you know, it, as, I, as I told someone yesterday, it's similar to what caused all the collapse of Lehman Brothers and that, that he's got so much, it's more than 40 times leveraging. It's crazy amounts. And so maybe it's that, the fact that someone's done it on the market, I mean, it's always been possible to do this, but the fact that someone's actually done it and can now get a trillion return on 180 billion isk in a relatively short period of time, it will probably take three months or so for him to turn this around and yeah, it might be that CCP take a look at margin trading because of this. But I, I think that it's a little bit of a problem if they don't put anything in its place, right? Because we touched upon uh, the whole thing about missing features in, in the whole financial sector, right? And if they're going to take away margin trade, they need to give the players an alternative. They need to give us something to maybe do player banking, right? Yeah, maybe. I don't see an issue with them. Well, I was a little bit saddened when I heard that that uh, they had backed away from sort of some of the things that the Eve Central Bank was was tasked with doing. Um, it's one of the reasons why we don't have banking in Eve, right? Because there is no regulatory compliance behind that. There is nothing. There is nothing that is providing any sort of you know people who are very over leveraged and using it to their max. But for most older traders, it's not. It's, it just means you have more liquid uh, isk lying about in your wallet. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't see an issue with them. Well, I was a little bit saddened when I heard that that uh, they had backed away from sort of some of the things that the Eve Central Bank was was tasked with doing. Um, 
it's one of the reasons why we don't have banking in Eve, right? Because there is no regulatory compliance behind that. There is nothing. There is nothing that is providing any sort of you know uh, security framework um, by which people have to comply with. So therefore, you know, the days of Eve Bank are gone because nobody trusts anybody enough to get involved with that. The idea of stock, you know, you know, trading stock. You know, you know, we've got shares of stock in the, you know, in the game, right? But, but, but th there always needs to be some sort of regulatory compliance. And if what they want to say is they just want to leave it up to the players, well, this isn't the, you know, this isn't the real world. The players cannot create that kind of regulatory framework that sort of has to come from CCP. We have it in terms of other elements of the game. So to pretend that, you know, well, we'll do it here, but not there. Is, is is just a choice on their part, right? I mean, we, we have the regulatory stuff that is theoretically behind the contract system. Yeah, but that, that goes back to the whole thing with missing features, right? Because um, one of the things that's been a problem in the MD like forever is that, that many of the things that, that, that people have been wanting to try and get off the ground, like anything from banking to uh, insurance services and uh, uh, stock exchanges, all of these things need some basic functionality that has not been supported by CCP. It's not even been discussed. Uh, and we've had uh, CCP saying that, well, uh, we're not, uh, the, the players are not mature yet for these things. And, and this is, well, to be honest, it's bullshit. It's not the players. It's bullshit. It's not the players. It's the features that are missing. If I cannot in any way do a forced buyback or resetting my shares, even when I'm voting for it, all of these things, if, if that's not possible, I can't do a, a stock exchange because then you have the whole thing of, of uh, uh, hostile takeovers and, and things like that. It's such a simple thing to implement. And the thing that uh, I keep talking to uh, my fellow MD about is feature creeping is a huge problem. And <laughs> many of the people uh, think that the world as it works now, the financial world is um, the way that CCP should, should make these features. And they really don't need to. They just need to give very, very simple, basic features. Oh, did we lose Dirk again? I'm still here voice-wise. My, my Skype press. What the hell is going on with me today? Well, uh, I don't know if, if, if you will agree with me on this, Dirk, but uh, things like um, in, in financial products history, right? The, the things that you have a bearer bond, the fact that you can actually carry it Right. This means that you can exchange it. It also means that potentially in EVE it could be destroyed. It, it could, it could uh, retain a uh, value based on what players put in, and this is basically a sort of escrow. So that's the minimum value it would always hold. Such things would be so simple for, for CCP to, to, to program, but we're not getting it. If uh, a crest call could, mm, could see into a contract and notice this bearable, uh, th this bearer bond, right? then players would be able to make these services. The same if it was a share, like an old style share that you got in a paper form, right? Same thing applies. CCP would not need to code all these things. Players would be able to do it. But if yes, there's no yeah, there are certainly value, tools that they can put in. There are certainly tools that they could put in that would make it easier for for third party creators to to do something as well. Uh, yeah, uh, again, it's... Yeah. You would, Even though you would end it's up a minority with of three people. things, right? Three things would be uh, the result if they added something like that. That you would get uh, a player-created currency in some form of, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, similar to um, to, to um, LP points in the LP store, right? You would get something like that as a potential feature. You would get bonds that had a nominal value. And then it would be just players trading it based on what the payout was compared to the market, right? And then you would be able to make actual shares that somehow could retain their votable rights. Or they could even separate it. So if you unplug it from the shares market, it becomes a B share. So you don't have a voting right. So, so there's so many things they could do, but it seems as if everything market related and, and the old corp related things have been left alone no one's touching it no one's looking at it and i think i don't even know if there's anyone left that knows how it works 
and well, you remember, you remember the old that. story about the pause code, right? And how antiquated that was. Um, I, I have no idea how antiquated their their market code is, or the contract code is, or, or anything like that. To where to tackle it, it becomes another one of these. Well, we need to build citadels. And and if I'm not mistaken, um, this ties into what we were talking about in in, in, in talking in stations. Uh, it smells of toffee phobia, right? Uh, I might be wrong, but I think Torfi had a hand in this, and what was that old programmer, the ancient one, Lekka? One of the really first programmers of the code. I think these people were the ones that, that created what we have now, and I think that, that it's, a, it's a big mistake that CCP keeps mm, ignoring it, because one of the major unique selling points of EVE is its economy. Of course the ecology is also very important like what gets destroyed and what gets built but the way it's traded has not been copied in any game no other game has a proper exchange system none and the um, fact that they don't play on that more seems weird yeah i've just got a comment in game uh that it says yeah caleb you mentioned a scrow eve used to have an scrow like uh, feature with the old contract engine as you know caleb because that's how you and entity used to make a lot of isk um, if Eve could review the old contract features and provide an escrow engine, then it might open up more of the financial features. Yeah, but and and especially if 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 somehow uh, I, I think now that they're looking at contracts, they might actually improve some things. Uh, when uh, we get the ability to do crest calls on contracts and do third-party tools and services, so basically people like Jeronica can add things that are missing in the current client like proper searchable things, like proper blacklists and whitelists, like uh, special uh, benefits or even something like courier contracts that you can have a reward system. It might actually only work in Mogul. So if you have uh, the contract showing up there, the, the, the bonus gets paid out via Mogul. But these things will not be possible unless we get these small tweaks. And that's why I'm, I'm asking for small, mm, Small, a little love, very small things. Um, we, I, you know, I was going to say, because even though it is a minority of people that might really get into this, right? It's one of those elements that contributes to the depth and breadth that Eve has over other things. It's why I hate calling Eve a game, because when we start talking about things like this, we are talking much more about this social science world simulator. Yeah, I'd like to just... Uh change subject briefly um there's something i've been asking about in the structures channel in game all week um regarding citadels uh on sissy you needed uh fighter skills in order to launch uh fighters from your citadels um this isn't a problem for null sec guys because you have carrier pilots and cap pilots with fighter skills but for high sec guys they don't normally have people who can uh yeah use fighters and i've just been told that at the moment uh, on, on TQ you do actually need fighter skills in order to launch fighters from your citadel so people will need to start injecting fighters 5 enjoy <laughs> yeah poor, poor just, high sec guys I just got through doing uh, doing light fighters 5 and I'm now on uh, support fighters 5 so it's uh it's, yeah. been a, it's been a fun, you know, hundred and something days after what I thought was never having to train another drone skill again on various carrier and uh, super carrier pilots. Yeah, people weren't sure because you were told that there wasn't going to be, you weren't going to need any special skills in order to man a citadel. Um, but yeah, at the moment you need fighter skills to launch fighters on TQ, though they are looking at changing it. So that might actually drive injectors up a little bit more than they've been. Because yeah, high set guys don't have people flying carriers uh, and having those drones. And it, that would make uh, sense to have it not needing any skills. Like looking at posses, you don't need like um, projectile turret skill to man a pos gun. So why would you need it to man a, um, or launch fighters for a citadel? Yeah, it, it's strange. It that... Yeah, they should have uh, gone with the same uh, thing with the uh... Uh, Starbase. The the bonuses that changed, right? So all the drone related things now add bonuses to the fighters instead. They should have done something similar with skills. So they only add bonus, not access. 
yeah, the impression I get is that it's not a definite it will stay like this, but yeah, just at the moment you do need it to launch fighters, so in case anyone's got a, a Citadel up in high sec that is going to be attacked soon, they might want to get their fighter skills up by injectors. But it ties into that other article uh, that was talking about how uh, uh, Force Auxiliaries were, uh, the sk skill were removed and how uh, CCP is actually interested in, in adding uh, some sort of uh, demand for SP, right? Uh, and that's really what's happening here. We're seeing Plex being converted into skill points, right? So that's the dependency in, 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 in the Plex economy, that the Plex needs to be converted into skill points, or of course into vanity stuff. Uh, so you have this, th this dynamic between uh, passive time and active time. Plex will uh, be tied into the uh, passive time and thus skill points, whereas active time, players being in space doing things, is going to be related directly into ISK. Right, because the the ISK faucet and how we suck that out of the of the system is based on active time. So what you get is that the value of ISK is directly storing man hours. I mean, it, if the current Plex decline, crash, bear market, whatever you want to call it, um, is being driven by the fact that uh, is partially being driven by the fact that. Um, they didn't give back those skill points. <sighs> yeah, I don't know how many skill points that would be. Um, but if it's being driven by the fact that people need skill points for things, then that creates a short-term phenomenon, right? This should wash out, and we should be back on trend, on long-term trend, um, which is just based on kind of the natural month-to-month -month supply and demand from either you know, the consumers of them or the people who given the ISK faucets in the game and the ability for people to accrue wealth in the game, uh, the, the storage of wealth as, you know, using Plex as a vehicle. Yeah, and it's also um, relating to what they did just before the, um, uh, when they uh, introduced uh, skill point trading. The whole thing with getting players to convert their Aurum, so they're, they're, they're checking up on how much stock of Aurum is in game. They're checking up on how much Plex is on stock in game. And and they have to figure out how to price all these different uh, mechanics and features like how many new skills are needed to actually sink some of the skill points out of this uh, uh, of the Plexus. So so the utility is is what they're they're working on and, and reducing the the stockpile so the, the supply does not go crazy. I mean, I, I would say that it's quite telling that when CCP re released that graph of uh, the s injected skills in Citadels, the top skill by quite a long way was Light Fighters. So, yeah, it does seem that people were waiting to flip their uh, Fax SP across, and now they haven't got the Fax SP. Whether that then means that when the Fax SP is uh, refunded, which I believe it's still going to be, then they'll just extract that and dump those injectors onto the market. So then that could cause injectors to go down. But honestly, I'm really surprised at the volume of injectors that are going per day. It's about 7,000 uh, per day in Jita, and that seems to be holding fairly steady. So it's a phenomenal amount that's being used every day. I have found it interesting that the, the, that the value of injectors, um, the actual skill point side of it, it has, has, has held pretty steady, has held at a level that I wouldn't necessarily have expected um, whereas the extractor side, the actual real money to extractor to you know value has has been the portion that has declined. Yeah, at the moment there's about uh, 400 million between an extractor and an injector. So for the SP farmers, this is still uh, incredibly profitable, even more so now because Plex is below a billion, and injectors are. They've dropped, but not as much as you would expect. They're around 620, 630 at the moment. And they were uh, 630 to 640 before uh, the, the patch. So, yeah, at the moment you can make definitely more than uh, a Plex per month easily by just farming SP. Which I'm, I'm not sure whether I'd like such a... Uh, I mean, I'm doing it, of course, right? But I'm not sure if I like such a passive way of getting uh, Plex plus... Uh, change from it well they have to have some sort of plan right because right now as, uh, as we're talking about the the, the parity that, that we're in positive numbers 
they have to be uh, planning to get it below, right? Otherwise, how are you going to keep demand up? Yeah, but it's very positive. I mean, at the moment, you can extract uh, just under four uh, injectors uh, worth per month. And a Plex right now is 951. And you get 400 million profit for each injector that you have. So you can do three, so that gets you 1,200. So you've got about 300 million isk profit per month just by uh, training a character. Yeah, but eventually it should, it should reach a point where Plex is below, right? So using Plex to train tanks uh, into a cost of what, 100 million or something like that. So we are in some sort of uh, free to play area but still not really so then ccp still needs to figure out how to create uh, a need for plex and they need to figure out what is the benefit going to be from uh, subscribing instead of buying plex because right now i don't see that much benefit from subscribing compared to buying plex whether it's in game or with your wa wallet right and i think that's a little bit of a problem i'm, I'm perfectly for some sort of free to play system but you need to have some sort of incentive for for the players that are then actually giving money to ccp yeah i mean i i didn't actually before injectors came along i wasn't actually training any of my accounts and i subscribed them all so uh at the moment i'm getting the full amount as profit and it, it's not wasted trading time for me because i wasn't training so i'm getting like 1.2 billion a month just for having a training skill running which is not bad but I'm surprised that it's uh, maintained so long, the profit that it's kept, because it's been fairly stable since it launched. So whether this will continue like this um, depends on what CCP bring out in terms of skill points uh, that people are needing. But it, it's been, what, three months now? And it's maintained the 400 million gap between extractors and injectors for pretty much the whole time. Maybe we need someone to math up that claim that um, the article I linked earlier, the claims that unrealized value of Plex currently in system is around three million dollars. I think that's what he said and if that's the case then we have to compare to the prior uh, market uh, volume of Plex and the difference now and then figure out when has all of that actually been exchanged? When is that out of the system? You're talking about the Plex that's sitting out there that has not been consumed. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, yeah. Th that was his. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, that number comes off probably comes off of the number from CCP's financials. Uh, yeah, that's where it's from. Income line. That's where it's from. Yeah. So that would be the number that needs to be tanked, right? That 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 needs to be depleted for the market to have some sort of normalcy. Yeah, but I, I think that you, you can't force people to get rid of it because even if you tank the price, then people are going to hold it in the hope that it goes back up because you're not going to dump your Plex at 300, 400 million uh, below what you bought it for. So there are stacks of Plex and that's just the way it is. You can't force people to offload. Well, I mean, those people that are sitting on Plex, right? Um, again, as just this storage of wealth as opposed to a trade, um what you know why are they going to sell what are they going to put their money into that is you know, I want to say passive like that um are they going to put it into something that is that is more that that is normally more volatile or where they don't see you know kind of a long term growth pattern because inflation in eve overall is is not very high. I mean, you, well, you do get certain segments that are up and down over time, but... Um, but what if you tie it into citadels, right? What if you take citadels into the equation? If there's not a lot of player activity, not a lot of citadels gets destroyed. That means that the value of the components will go down, right? So opposite, if there's a lot of players and there's a lot of activity and if there's things like wars going on on a massive scale, a lot of them will be destroyed and a lot of the component value will go up because the demand will go up. So what you might actually see is that storage in 
things like that might be the solution away from Plex. Oh, I think the only thing that would make it's it's not uh, switching storage. I think if people want to store wealth, they'll always keep it in Plex. It's that they need to have something that they want to spend it on. Um, whether that is buying a Palatine keep stuff, because yeah, why not have a two hundred trillion um, thing in space that everyone can blow up, or maybe even your own Excel. This might get people to liquidate, but there's nothing else in Eve that you can move your is to and just know that it will definitely have a value when you come back because everything else as you said Dirk is subject to CCP going yeah we've decided we don't like Tritanium so we're going to remove it from the game or you know anything they want to do whereas Plex yeah you can always come back and dump it onto the market and get some liquid is back from it well, so, yeah, I mean, it's certainly more nuanced than the, them getting rid of, you know, Tritanium from the game, right? Um, they, they make tweaks to, to battleships, or they change the build requirements of super capitals, or they change the yield that comes from mining belts. I mean, you know, any of these things that they change out there, right, has a, you know, has an impact on, on what the value of all of these items are going to be, you know, whether they're moon goo related or mineral related or, or the drops from NPCs. Well, this is uh, tied into what Siegel was saying in that whole thing about the sandbox uh, and and the new philosophy of CCP of letting players just go crazy and not trying to plan ahead and 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 expecting some certain outcome. Uh, I think the interesting thing is here that they call this the ecosystem, but when you introduce something into an ecosystem in the real world you have the huge risk of collapse, right? And so they might actually need to at least be uh, regulating a little bit more because if they got the predator-prey dynamic wrong, you're going to get overshooting and then you're going to get a full collapse, right? And recovering from that type of collapse might not be as easy as they think. So I think they need to be looking at, well, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, at hiring an ecosystem scientist because I don't think they really have anyone at the moment that's got a clue about how players use these things and what it actually means to the overall ecology. And that ties directly into the economy, right? So mm, I think we're a little bit in the in a risk time and well, that's in interesting, but I don't want to end up uh, with uh, an island without trees. I, you know, I think we're in a much better place today um, than we were certainly five or six years ago in terms of there was once a time when I when I really didn't think at all that when they went and made a game mechanic change that they really strongly considered the effects that that was going to have on the overall economy it was a game mechanic change and it was there for the the, the gaming side of things and the unintended consequence that that might lead to in the economy wasn't really a consideration. I think people like Dr. E, I think people like uh, CCP Quant and Recurve, um, you know, ha have brought more of a, hey, we need to watch this to that whole equation. Oh, definitely. It's definitely been improved. And I I'm, not, I'm not being a catastrophist here. I'm just saying that when they bring in something as huge as Citadels, which is basically a totally new beast, because you're making stations a cyclical. I was trying to point this out in another stream when someone was talking about SOV. Uh, and, and if you have something that big in the game being a cyclical and being part of the creation destruction dynamic, uh, that's gonna bring some huge changes that might not be balanced with what we had before. Hey, here's a question that I don't know if it's been addressed out there or not. So. We talked about it a bit the other night on Talking In Stations with regard to uh, the possibility of shifts from market hubs, <clears throat> NPC-based market hubs, to player-controlled Citadel market hubs. And the shift in tax revenue that would happen there from being an ISK sync to an ISK transfer to another player. And what that might mean, because I mean, would this result in in more ISK staying in the game than exiting the game? Because we already know that faucets far outweigh sinks as far as the entire economy goes. Yeah, and, and, and if the, the balance between creation uh, and destruction is then correct, then this redistribution system that's basically going to happen should actually uh, 
make the whole ecology self-sustaining but they need to find the right balance point right and i think there's a lot of uh, things that are very unbalanced especially when it comes to things like industry the the time restraints on industry you can basically produce all the battleships needed in the entire game for a month uh, as a single player that makes no sense there's no strain in that uh, you need to, to put in some sort of uh, limitations so that there is room for competition. I think Dirk's kind of right that one of the things that is putting off, maybe it's a small group of players, but it's definitely putting some people off, is if someone's got a Citadel and they've got broker fees, you're effectively giving them your money every time you do a trade there. And depending on who that entity is, people may not feel happy effectively plexing lots of people's accounts every month um, for that. But it would change the broker fees from a uh, sync to a cycling of ISK around it as well. Um, but that would probably depend on the the trade hub getting big enough. Uh, I don't think a small uh, hub in uh, a system without stations for a corp or alliance and their friends is going to bring in huge amounts of ISK. But if they manage to be a new trade hub somewhere, then yeah, they, that person would or that court would get a lot of this coming in from the broker fees. Standpoint of of whether or not you care that you know I don't know, Pandemic Legion owns this Citadel and you're giving money to them, or or I want Isk, you know, now no longer just has a casino, he's got a Citadel and it's the market hub that people are going to, and oh look, you're giving more money to him, or it's the Matani for God's sakes, uh, but more the fact that. Um, Again, the imbalance between faucets and sinks in the game, for every ISK, I, I wasn't thinking of it so much from the standpoint of, of whether or not you care that, you know, I don't know, Pandemic Legion owns this Citadel and you're giving money to them, or, or I want ISK, you know, now no longer just has a casino, he's got a Citadel and it's the market hub that people are going to and, oh, look, you're giving more money to him, or it's the Matani, for God's sakes. Uh, but more the fact that, um, again, the imbalance between faucets and sinks in the game, for every ISK paid as a broker fee to anyone, who cares who they are, that's an ISK that's no longer leaving the economy. Yeah, and, does that, and does that just, well, 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 does that just aggravate the imbalance that already exists? No, I think it makes it a lot more healthy because that means that the the, the value of ISK in, in that it should be carrying the intrinsic uh, labor or man hours put into it, that will then suddenly be more real and not controlled by uh, some sort of uh, state, right? I don't know. I, I know that broker fees are not an insignificant amount when you look at them as a whole um, into the economy as a sink. But I, I think that for individual players, yeah, most of them don't have a clue unless they use a third-party tool how much they actually pay out in broker fees every month. Um, that's a UI problem, right? Really, something when they have these features in game, they need to make the supporting features as well. The fact that we are depending on so much third-party development, like things like Ivernus and and Eleanor and and other tools like that, to even show something as simple as the margin and the tax losses, this is well, frustrating. I mean, Honestly, even with Mogul, which shows the taxes, I don't look at the taxes. I just look at what profit did I get today. Um, so I, I don't think... I think on an individual level, people are whining about the new tax increases. Um, I think once they've settled into it, they won't notice it. But as Dirk said, if it goes to somebody in a citadel, then that's suddenly a lot of risk coming back into the economy if they get a trade hub big enough. And that might yeah, cause imbalances elsewhere in the system. Well, you know, it is it, it is funny, right? Nobody wants to pay more tax than what they have to. Nobody wants more coming out of their pocket than, yeah. <laughs> uh, tax somebody else. D don't tax me, right? Um, but but what's interesting about it all is is right now you've got Plex going down in, in, in value, okay? We've never had an uproar about Plex going down in value. It only happens when it goes up in value, and then you get everybody out there who starts screaming Plex is too damn high, right? Nobody's screaming, you know, Plex is too damn low. I mean, there's the people who own them are, are you know, might be saying, oh, geez, it's too low. But nobody cares about the rich 1%. <laughs> 
this ties very much into real life gold buggery, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Because gold has no real intrinsic value. It's it's a minimal real value. The the utility of gold is in a few things like electronics, and that's it. And the amount of gold that is currently on top of the world, right, up on the earth, is uh, going to be enough for several hundred years of consumption for utility. So it's only a storage value, and people are starting to not really care. It's the same with the sharing economy and things like that. So in real world terms, it's a very interesting thing to see something similar in EVE, that, that plex and storage of value without an intrinsic value, a utility, is well, extremely important. It's funny because people, you know, people tend to use gold as as their analogy to to, to plex, right? Um, I've always tended to use. I think it's more akin to platinum, okay? Because platinum actually has more utility value as a rare metal um, th than gold does. Gold is a shiny object; it's used in a few things, but by and large, it is a storage of wealth and a shiny object. Platinum is used in far more things. It has far more utilitarian value than, or far more utility than, than, than gold. And so does Plex. Plex has these other uses, has, you know, has a, actually nowadays has a lot of uses. Um, so I've always compared it to platinum more than, more than gold. And this brings on the next logical step in, in, in the line of what is valuable, right? Because with citadels, we might actually end up having a proper real estate market. Yeah, because you can transfer them. Uh, you can sell them to somebody else, uh, which you're obviously not going to do it for free, are you? You're not going to put down an Excel, uh, fit it, and then give it to some random guy. So it's, that's a potential way that it can go in the future. And then populations become important, right? Because if you're selling something in a high population area, that means that you're more likely going to get a lot of income from the fees that are actively in the game. So, and not just that, you're also, uh, I will not be buying my Citadel in Udama, but I might buy one in uh, Galdari Prime. So we're starting to look at things like crime. Well, you would and like to, stats, you right? <laughs> you you would like to be able to buy it in Caldari Prime. However, <laughs> the the, uh, the the price might be so significant there that you actually have to live, you know, closer to you know, Udama or or who knows, maybe even in Tama. And and it Rancer. also brings on the the option of a player control police, right? Because if someone creates a an anti mercenary corporation or something like that, and police a system from gankers. So then you have a police and a criminal element and then it's going to be a battle because the real estate value and the profits being made by the owners of the citadels etc is going to then pay for these things. Right? So you're, you're seeing a whole new ecosystem evolve and I, I do think that it's positive because it looks as if it's more um, widely uh, represented and it's got a lot of species right. There's a, there's a lot of stuff going on now that's going to bring a lot of emergent gameplay. We could have space real estate agents like we have space lawyers. We could have space lawyers who specialize in real estate transfers. Uh, who knows? Maybe what? Maybe what, instead of just transferring a citadel to somebody else, you have to go through a process, and uh, there will be closing costs involved, which would be another risk sick. And that ties into the game that, that I was going to mention, um, Archage, if um, any of you have tried that. Yeah. Because in Artage they had this nice little feature that you could sell real estate. Real estate was uh, a limited resource, right? Uh, so you had to do the whole land grab thing. And then when you did that, you could then sell the buildings that you had built on it. And doing that, you needed a certificate that was actually a sink that you paid to the, uh, the developers, right? So you, so you pulled money out of the system. So things like that is very interesting. but. I, uh, maybe uh, maybe CCP prefers to just keep it uh, in player versus player uh, environments and not actually interfere. But it is a, an interesting place to put a, a tax, right? A real estate tax. Yeah.
that would actually be kind of amazing, right? It, you know, it, if you did, and once again, it gets back to this whole thing of, and where does Eve separate itself from being a video game about spaceships to being about the fundamental building and administration of a world? It's really becoming a perfect simulator. There's not a lot missing. I think only the thing that I keep ending up talking about, the, 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 the fact that we still don't have stations that we can walk in and have locations in and we still don't have bodies but if we get that then you would have what would be equivalent to a hundred percent perfect simulator you're talking about um the height trend yes uh one of the last things that i would like to talk about before we uh we close is um Every time there's a patch um, and we get new stuff, uh, one of the phenomena that um, is in effect and it's really obvious in, uh, in, in, in EVE is what's called the hype cycle. Yeah, I thought it was kind of cool. I can see those trends going on at the same time. Um, I guess injectors would be a good um, thing about that. It was really high demand, lots of price, a high price there, and then uh, it dipped a little right when they came out. Yeah, you start to see things moving just before the patches hit, and yeah, then it ends up not being quite as... Well, injectors are a weird one because they ended up being more successful than anyone actually thought, um, because the general feeling before injectors was that, yeah, they'll be used a little bit, but not widely. And at the moment, yeah, they're, they're incredibly successful. Um, it's probably, I, I think a lot of people thought CCP had messed up with doing injectors, but it has turned out to be one of their better things. But one of the hype things at the moment, as, as we mentioned on Talking Stations, was the fax uh, ships. There is There was so many of those that people were prepping for because speculation, they're going to make so much ISK when it comes out. And now there's probably a year's supply of fax sitting in people's... Uh, hangers somewhere, which is then making the prices crash fast. The interesting thing about the hype cycle is that it repeats itself on almost every single new item in E. There's a few exceptions um, when you have uh, tie-ins with other things, uh, especially things like uh, the, the skill trading, uh, the injectors, the extractors, and then of course the fact that they tie into Plex. But any other item seem to follow the exact uh, development in price as any hype cycle. So you always get this extreme uh, high price and then it dips into the trough and then it kind of picks up and finds its natural price. Uh, and I think a lot of speculators are using this exact thing every single time, depend, uh, deciding when to get in, when to get out and how perfect the graph is showing the hype cycle and where they are. So they're basically using this every single time. The, the funny detail is that if you look at why skill trading is not the same, it's because you've got these uh, three items that are so closely tied together that you actually get uh, um, you get the periodicities are entangled. So uh, this is exactly like when you have the um, the three linked pendula; it becomes chaotic. So you don't get these nice uh, price developments in uh, in those three items, and we can expect slightly more volatility in all of those markets because it's tied directly to skill point trading. So it's just funny to see how you have these phenomena uh, coinciding. Because as I as I've tried to explain to some of the people that are getting into farming, is that you're going to see periodicity in when people are actually harvesting and when they are buying Plex. So, so these things will be based on patience and, uh, uh, well, greed really, right? So how long do you dare wait before you start cashing in? And how long do you dare wait for the Plex market to reach a point where that fits with your profits? So people will start eventually to need to 
budget and that means that you're going to get layers of different cycles depending on the individual players and how active they are and how big their farms are. Is that something um, we can put into mogul kind of um, analysis of that sense? With, um, I'm not the right person to everything. ask about putting t technical analysis uh, tools into into mogul because I'm a little bit against it because even though there are patterns that you can that you can find that you can follow, they are so mm -hmm. sensitive to psychology and then the fact that uh, well, it's not that we have regulation, but everything CCP makes, we can't tell uh, the actual utility beforehand. We don't know how popular or unpopular f fighters of a specific kind are going to be. We don't know which ones are OP and which ones need uh, need boosting, right? So, so until we get that, we can't really do proper technical analysis. Yeah, there's a whole aspect of, say, an alliance changing their um, fleet compositions. If they just decide not to buy Maelstroms, for example, then that Maelstrom market may crash. And that's and very funny with, uh, with uh, what we saw in uh, in this whole war period. That initially we had some of those B things; they were flying around in, in shiny bling, right? And as soon as there was a proper demand for ISK, and you you got that whole financial problem, they shifted to cheaper stuff, right? So now they are going to be more and more focused on performance per ISK. There is there is an element of that, you know. You know, as somebody who's you know part of the Imperium, right? I mean, obviously things started off flying flying yacht fleet materials. Um, then there was actually the okay um, um, because these are pirate faction, we're not going to be able to. If we are going to lose them, trying to replace them is going to be much more difficult. It's something we went through with with the old uh, the old TFIs that we flew. Anyways, um, so they moved over to to the new version of the Baltic Megathron battleship initially right anytime you have a war anytime that you have a major alliance or coalition make a shift out there to a new doctrine it completely changes the 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 markets for the ships they used to fly for the ships that they're now going to fly um especially if they end up being destroyed um but what's interesting is is that you know who really makes the money off of that the people who are in the know of the decision to do that, right? Uh, you don't have in you have insight into it at, you know, in the general market after the fact, but the insiders of major doctrine changes really have the opportunity to front run that market. Yeah, but they yeah, can they also speculate low. long term, right? They can they can sure. think about these things long term and say, well, we know that these things are pretty cheap. We're just going to keep buying them s s without telling anyone. And then suddenly they will swap their entire doctrine and 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 the composition of the of the strategy because you can you can change your strategy and and the effect per isk will be improved just because you've been planning this for a long time uh, and that will change the entire ecosystem and and with citadels this is going to be even more interesting especially when the other structures roll out because when you then need to say take space or uh, eradicate a competitor or something like that his setup will will be something that you need to adapt to and since the underlying location will not be the same well I'm at least hoping that we're going to get more diversity uh, from CCP then the ecosystem in the local area in the local region is going to decide what type of stuff is in there structure wise and that means that you're going to use different strategies to take it down. That means that is going to show up in, in the type of stuff that's lost. So stockpiling things like that and planning very long term is going to definitely be a thing we see from Citadels, I think. Yeah, um, people who have invested heavily in P4 minerals or materials before, like probably months ago, are probably reaping the benefits by now because they saw the um demand increase from the citadel so yeah, they decided yeah. to stock up 
And if, even if they're building their citadels, they're building them for a fraction of the price people are right now. So, a lot more disposable, I, I guess you could say. Well, it's it, the same the, the with... Sorry, go ahead. The structure components would actually be something interesting because uh, before citadels, structure components were, were used for uh, outposts. So they were mostly built for use down in Null or wherever and they didn't come through the GDA market. But with uh, the citadels using them and presumably the future structures too, then it could be like um, with Tech 2 modules, you don't usually build your own components, you buy them off the market. And Citadel components, I think people will just buy off the market eventually. Uh, and so we could start to see structure components being actually traded more on the market. Um, yeah, but the P4 prices were definitely interesting. I mean, we bought ours in November. Um, and the same with our Tech 2 salvage and uh, Tech 1 salvage. So that was when it was still back at the old prices. And so there's definitely been some nice profits to be made on there the last few days. But the tight thing was deciding whether to buy it, uh, to dump it before the patch because it started spiking heavily uh, two to three days before the patch. So it was whether you dump it then uh, or you wait for patch day because if you wait for patch day, you risk all the other speculators also dumping on the same day. And we've seen that with uh, the uh, salvage already. It spiked really badly first day and now it's crashing back down uh, to the early levels. But fortunately, we got all ours out on uh, patch day, which was nice. Getting out on the peak is always best. Uh, interesting <laughs> fact is what you mentioned there is something that I really hope that CCP is planning on doing is equivalent to a Dutch auction of the old real estate, right? So basically, you're saying, well, if you take down your POS and recycle it now, you will get these items in two months we're going to reduce the content of this and so on and so forth all the way until like come December if you re recycle a pass or uh, the stuff in, a, in an outpost or similar right then if you take it down at that point you're going to get less from that if they if they did something like that they could get they could motivate players to migrate a lot faster than they might have planned yeah, I think a market that is worth watching for uh, with the citadels and the other structures is the um, fuel blocks because right now uh, fuel blocks are used for service modules on citadels and there are posses still up which use them but over the next year or so there's going to be the eight structures coming out and presumably they will be uh, using uh, fuel blocks for their service modules in the same way and so instead of having one structure using all the fuel blocks uh, a corp might potentially have four or five different structures up which are all burning through uh, the fuel blocks at the same time and a market module on its own uses the same amount of fuel as a large POS per month it's 40 blocks per hour so I think the demand for uh, fuel blocks is going to go up over the next uh, year or so the same with uh, PI and <clears throat> the salvage because Yes, uh, posses uh, or, and citadels and structures only need to be built once, but the later structures, uh, the industry, and all the way down to the billboards are less and less defensive than uh, a citadel is. So these will be getting exploded more often. So there, it is a good way that CCP have got demand for PI to actually go up because PI, apart from P4 and certain ones that are used in POS fuel, have been heavily undervalued since they came out. So it's a nice way to get this going up over the next year or so. Do what do you feel about do any strontium clathrates? Oh, Didn't they add those to the fuel box now? So uh, yeah. the worth of strontium is perceived higher? Yeah. Uh, well, well, that's where they have a bit of duplica uh, duplication, right? Because you know, you're using them in fuel blocks, you're using them you know, for, the, for these citadels, but you're also still using them for reinforcement of posits. But this ties into, was so weird. This, this ties into the whole thing of integrating different types of players and different types of locations right this could be some sort of uh, very brilliant uh, interconnectedness that CCP has actually been planning on so so you got the man hour from from the the, the, the miners and that ties into uh, the the citadels and it ties into uh, 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 ships that that need jump fuel right so you don't need jump fatigue it's going to balance out in 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 a in a decent way in 
either you have to throw man hours to get your fuel, or you have to throw isk at it. So you don't need to have a feature like jump fatigue at all. Yeah, I was going to say about the strunt, that was actually really weird. Um, a couple of months ago, it was 500 isk per unit. Um, and then they announced that it would actually be in fuel blocks, and they announced that it would be a lot higher than it is now. And that made it spike. So I dumped mine at 1500, thinking, yeah, it's, it's not going to go higher than 1500. And it's been up to 7000 or so. Um, and as far as I know, it's still climbing. And it is a bit of a mystery. It's partly that it's uh, difficult to move out of null because it's bulky. And when Maybe. they when they changed the fuel blocks they actually they were meant to reduce the volume and they didn't reduce the volume so on the first couple of days there was a lot of times with triage uh, ships and that having problems having enough uh, strunt for going for, for using it but then they changed the number that you need so i'm not sure why the price has continued rising whether it's due to it being uh, stockpiled down in null uh, for the war or for whatever um, but it, it's strange that it's increased tenfold over the last few months. Uh, I don't know what price it is in game now. Um, I'm just going to check that. But it's it's gone up a crazy amount. Let me just check Strunt. That's yeah, about five thousand at the moment, which is just crazy. I mean, we, uh, like what we've always known about Strunt, right? Strunt was used for two things. Yeah, you know, well, a couple small things with capital ships. So depending on how much. Uh, dreadnoughts were going into siege or or carriers were going into triage right which in the grand scheme of eve not not a lot right but there were you know however many countless units out there being used as just part of the reinforcement timer for for pauses that were all over creation but now you throw into this you know th throw into it the fact that it's going to be part of fuel blocks yes for citadels which haven't quite taken off yet but for every pause out there, and now it's this huge, valuable commodity, which is so heavy and hard to move. Do you think yeah. there's someone that's in the know about something that the majority might not have yet? Do you think there's well, not, well? Do you think there's actually some insider trading going on here? I don't know what it could be, but well, you could speculate that it might tie into something like the swiples and that nerf. I mean, I, I think I'm looking at the graph now, and in up till the 14th of February, Stromp was like 600 isk per unit, and then they announced it would be in fuel blocks, so you get one big spike uh, of Stromp, and after that it's settled down, but the price has just kept going and going and going. So in the space of two months, it's gone from 600 isk per unit to 5,800 per unit, and it's yeah, I think Dirk's right that it's because it's now in but in every single uh, fuel block that goes into a POS and it's in the reinforcement in POSs and now it's in the citadels as well this is but it, it's a phenomenal rise in such a short time and it's not proportional to what we know or at least I don't think it yeah. is it, 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 it's not mathed up properly so it's way over what would be expected even if we start getting a, a well nice population of citadels so uh, I'm just well, thinking I mean, if someone is in the know well, about something that got, we haven't seen yet. As long as you have both citadels and pauses in existence at the same time, right? You're going to have this this um, uh, duplication going on out there. Yeah, I mean the volume's doubled, but the price has yeah gone up tenfold. So it, it's a weird thing. Three months ago, it was at Two million units a day. Now it's at three to four million units a day. So it, it's it is a doubling in the usage, but it's not the, the price is far uh, outperforming what what the volume has changed. Yep. Do I, do any of you um, um, trade in Moongoo? Sometimes, yes. Only margin flipping. Because well, because you know one of the things I've been wondering is with what's happened with what is it the six regions of the Imperium all of the all of the moons that were out there being farmed themselves all of the uh, reaction farms that are or were out there and are about to change I mean you know we we could be in for a period of a of a, of a heavy dislocation in terms of 
what used to be a very stable source of moon goo. Now, whether they were using that internally or whether that was getting transferred to, you know, Jitta for redistribution across the rest of the world, um, doesn't really matter, right? I mean, it's all supply. It, it reminds me very much of like when you have a war in the Middle East and, um, you know, uh, you know, oil spikes because, well, production is going to go down. Well, oddly, a lot of the advanced moon goo has been falling, uh, like crystalline carbonide has gone off a cliff since the middle of February. It's gone down from 220 a unit down to 170 or so. Um, but I, I think a lot of the moons have actually been taken over. I know one of our friends in game, he uh, was down somewhere in some of the Sov and he thought he'd put up a POS because yeah, there was an empty moon and it turned out to be a very profitable moon to have for him to have just dumped a POS onto. So I don't think there's a lack of supply, I think. Uh, that yeah, it is getting taken up uh, by new people that are down just in the Sov area. But as as well, you've got the you've got the new use of uh, advanced moon goo in the uh, as I said on the talking in stations, the new T two components for caps are all using uh, sub cap components. So this has put pressure onto uh, moon goo and components as well, and that's been spiking. In certain of in certain uh, components and certain uh, materials that go into them. Yep. So you, know, you feel, oh, good, I think. You, you feel if the even if the reaction farms were removed, the um the, the demand from the tech two capital mods and stuff uh, is kind of balancing it up, keeping the um the want to buy and want to sell about the same. Yeah, I mean, I would say so. I mean, there are still, or there were last night just before I went to bed, there were still uh, components that were completely out of stock in Jita. So that's three, four days after the patch, there's still not a resupply coming. Which is absolutely insane when you think about it. Yeah, so it should be going up. Yeah, I, th I think the, the prices will be going up uh, because now you've got the... I mean, it depends how many caps get blown up that they need to replace the T2 mods in them. But all caps having the T2 mods now is going to definitely put pressure on uh, subcap components. Could it also be the uh, speculators trying to dump their stock, seeing a quick sell? Do you think? I, I think on some of them, uh, not all of the components are equal, of course. They're not all used in the new cap mods uh, to the same degree. And on a lot of them, you are seeing the price falling, um, but there are some key ones, like uh, some of the, let me see if I can find one. The antimatter reactor unit has gone absolutely crazy. It's uh, been down at around 134. Um, it was selling it up to 200,000, 300,000 per unit. And I heard that at one point that they were being listed at a million per unit up in Jita. So, yeah, I think there's speculators that were trying to get in on it because it was known on Sissy that the uh, T2 cap component, uh, T2 cap mods are not using the cap components. Um, but I, I think people just did the same as they did with salvage. There was a lot of people that heard Citadels use uh, salvage for their rigs and just bought all the salvage um, and not all the salvage is used in the rigs. So a lot of the prices crashed and people were complaining that, yeah, you told me salvage would go up. I bought salvage, it's crashed and it's because they were buying the wrong salvage. And it's the same with the components, I think. Just because we are at the two hour mark, I was thinking if we should uh, close off with uh, maybe some uh, tips on what people think is gonna go up and what people think might be going down. Dirk, do you have any prognosis, any ideas? What are you uh, thinking of putting your money into? Honestly, I. I am starting to be more of a buyer of Plex at these levels, um, I, mainly because the liquid disk I have um, is is for long term storage, um, and I don't see why the demand. If we've got more people coming back to the game, if there is more interest in the game, there are always going to be the people out there that want game time. There are always going to be the people out there who are going to want to uh, store their wealth someplace. And Plex continues, I think, to be the to be the standard for that. 
Um, you know, so I'm more of a long-term investor rather than a trader. And uh, yeah, so I'm starting to uh, accumulate and I will accumulate down further if I need to. But uh, you know, I think long-term Plex is, is still a, uh, it's still a good value buy at this point. <laughs> Interesting. I do not agree, but uh, interesting. Uh, Geronica, what would you put your money into if uh, if you were a smart bunny? Mobile subscriptions. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. When are we going to get the shares? I can, can 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 we see an IPO thread on the MD within the next month or two, uh, so we can start buying in and reading your business plan? <laughs> I don't know if it'll be a public. Um share system that that we'll, we'll talk about that at another time um i do Secret think shares. in about eight yeah. months eight months maybe we might be able to do a public offering but um to start off i want to start it kind of small and controlled and then uh, let it go from there but um i'm with dirk i i just bought some plex recently too i think we hit the four with it now so uh, i'm gonna hold on to it until it reaches the point where I want to sell it or that could be a bad decision and uh, I'll lose a bill or two. So we, got, so we got two plexes. What would you go for, Rebra? Well, as you know, I'm most mostly a station trader uh, riding waves. So uh, at the moment, I've been making a lot of risk off of the new items. Um, but yeah, I'm with Jeronica and Dirk. Um, I think that at the moment, I, I'm not sure if it's reached the floor yet uh, before it bounces back up. But I, I think I would be buying into Plex uh, now um, because, yeah, it's going to go back up over time. So, yeah, definitely buying in. And Caleb's, of course, sell all the Plex. Yeah, and I've explained my reasons, but apparently people don't think that the new players are wallet risk uh, rich. So, anyways, my bet would be um, things like Morphite because I think it's going to take some time for new people to get out there and mine new stock. And with all the new Tech 2 stuff coming out, I think there's going to be a run and a demand. I'm not, I'm not sure that there's stockpiles enough, or at least that people are willing enough to part with it. So I would definitely look at uh, Morphite. And I feel slightly similar about Isogen because that should not be that low. There's, the, this is something that if, if it's real then there should be a need for an intervention at some point from CCP because it's way below what it should be. I, I think they should be more worried about Isogen and well even Nox to some extent than uh, they should about Plex. So that's what I would look at. So three to one on Plex. You are outvoted. <laughs> well, yeah. What I will say is this: I think that, you know, I think that the three to one are are probably more long term in nature. His is more of a trader type of you know uh, short term outlook. Yeah, I, I would uh, say so. Unless, unless what you think, Caleb, is that is that um, we've reached a new what a new lower equilibrium point. Well, I think the, the the thing with Plex and the reason I, I do like it short term, I, I kind of agree with all of you on short term, but I do not agree with you on long term because as we see more players coming in, as the brands mature and start being integrated, and you suddenly go to a hundred, uh, sorry, a hundred percent or more uh, player increase, then there's going to be a new segment, and I think the people that are coming in are not going to be the real money poor. It's going to be the time poor and real money rich so that means that i believe that we're going to see more wallet warriors and less uh, uh time rich players less koreans uh more dirks well uh, one of the things that one of the things that i thought back when they came out with injectors or, or that Locke and i talked about when they came out with injectors right is is really before injectors if you wanted to transfer real money into in-game currency, right? Your your only true vehicle for that was Plex. Injectors gave an alternative to that. True. If you were somebody who wanted to look at the price differentials and try and you know figure out, well, what can I get more ISK per dollar for? Well, I now have this new option. And as long as that new option exists out there, um, 
the supply of Plex, the actual, you know, people buying it with real money and putting it in, you know, injecting it into the game. Um, I just, I just see that that side of it, be, you know, is potentially lower than what it once was. Whereas anybody who can Plex their account and play to pay um, will do that. I don't think so if there's still a demand for ISK. If they still need ISK, they would rather just Well, if they need in. ISK. Right, 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 right. But when you look at the people who need ISK from their real money wallet versus the number of players who just want to be able to play the game for what they perceive to be free, but really it's the sweat off their back in doing so. Mm, true. Uh, I, I'm just saying that I, I think when we suddenly have double the number of players, I think we will see that uh, the influx of, of Plex will be above what is currently the demand because the new players might not necessarily end up in the three or four count area. Well, I, I think as well the thing is when people are like, the Plex is too damn high. At a billion isk, it's about 40, billion per, uh, 40 million per day that you need to make to plex your account and that's not really an amount of risk that someone who's been playing for a while shouldn't be able to make if you aren't making 40 million a day in some way or another by the time you've been around a year or so then there's a, a problem but it, it it's just that it's a it sounds like a big number so you tell someone yeah it's 1.2 billion or 1 billion for plex and they panic but it's on a daily level it's yeah it's an insignificant amount and if you really want the the crazy idea Mm, there might be some interest in clothing and similar vanity based items because if the brands are starting to expand that might be something that people will use a lot more especially if the new maybe, players are more space barbie maybe there can find, get us some shoes yeah shoes shoes is going to be big when Senoria takes a seat yeah invest in shoes invest in shoes you heard it here first Thanks to everyone that tuned in, and I think we reached something like 60 viewers. What? Not bad for a first run. Thanks for dropping by, and uh, I hope we can have you on at some point, especially when there's news from Eve Mogul. And Dirk is around pretty much all the time. Well, when he's not with his normal friend Wiggles. So this week was without Wiggles. Yeah, Thanks well, for having me. Thank you for having me. This was a great conversation. Thanks.